so the speaker today is Jeffrey John Siracusa, uh, who is an associate professor at Swansea uh, University in Wales, and he is going to tell us about multi-parameter persistence versus parameterized persistence. Okay, thanks. This is a bit of a novel format for me, so uh, let's see how this goes. Uh, also, because of the time difference, I, I'm sitting here in Swansea watching the sunset out my window uh, as I give the talk, which is something I've never done before. Um, so, so I want to talk about the difference between um, multi-parameter persistence, which is something that a lot of people have been interested in in uh, topological data analysis, and what I'm going to call parameterized persistence, which is a basically a slightly different perspective on essentially the same thing. So the, the quick review, the obligatory uh, quick review of persistent homology is we, we start with something like a point cloud inside some uh, big uh, Euclidean space. And we imagine uh, inflating little balloons around each of the points. And then as these balloons touch each other, as they get bigger and bigger, we uh, build up a simplicial complex. When two balloons touch, we insert an edge. We have a vertex for each balloon. And when three balloons make contact, then uh, we have a, uh, a two simplex and when four balloons make contact, we have a, a, a three simplex and so on. So we build up this simplicial complex that uh, encapsulates the combinatorics of the intersections of the balls around our data points. Um, and then we throw away the balls and we just work with that simplicial complex. And so this, uh, it's not just one simplicial complex, it's a whole sequence of simplicial complexes. And Depending on how you build it, usually it comes as either, uh, it'll usually come as, uh, in fact, a filtered simplicial complex. So a simplicial complex equipped with a filtration. And then we, uh, we look at the homology of these simplicial complexes. So if we take a sequence of real values for the uh, parameter at the uh, inflation of these balls, a sequence of parameter values is going to give us a sequence of simplicial complexes. And these maps will often be inclusions, but not necessarily. Uh, and then we can apply uh, the uh, functor of homology with field coefficients to this sequence of simplicial complexes. And we get a sequence of vector spaces. So a sequence of vector spaces like this, or a, a vector space that's indexed by the real numbers uh, where when you increase that indexing, then you have a linear map from one vector space to the next, is called a uh, persistence vector space or a persistence module. So the, the fundamental fact about these things that makes this really incredibly useful is if you have such a diagram of vector spaces, then you can always choose bases for each of the individual vector spaces that are compatible with the transition maps. So what that means is that we choose a basis for each one of the vector spaces, and we choose them in such a way so that each of these transition maps sends each basis vector to either zero or a basis vector in the next one in the sequence. And if we do that, then each basis vector has a well-defined birth time associated to it, which is the point in the sequence where that basis vector first appears, where it's not hit by anything that comes from an earlier time. And it has a well-defined death time, which is the last point at which it's non-zero. And then you go one step further along the sequence and it's sent to zero. So each basis vector has a birth time and a death time, and we have some list of basis vectors. We have a combinatorial or visual way of presenting this information. In fact, there are two that uh, frequently get used. Um, one is called a persistence diagram, where you plot the birth time of each generator on the x-axis and the death time on the y-axis. And so we have a collection of points above the diagonal, uh, because of course death has to come after birth. Uh, so each, each basis vector, or e each trail of basis vectors in this sequence of vector spaces gives us one point in the persistence diagram and a typical persistence diagram will have many of these points above the diagonal. Uh, alternatively, there's the barcode representation where we take, a, uh, we take one of these persistence vector spaces and to each basis vector we associate, or to each trail of basis vectors, we associate a bar 
that has a birth time when that basis vector first appears and a death time which is when that basis vector disappears and so the length of the bar is how long that basis vector uh, sits around for before it's gone. Now it's useful to compare these uh, these uh, pictorial representations of these uh, of, of this persistent homology uh, and for this we use uh, the a notion called the bottleneck distance. So let, let me just step back for a second and say that there's sort of two methodologies, two, two ways that persistent homology generally gets used in, in a very broad sense. Um, in one of these methodologies, you have a collect, you have a data set, a collection of samples. Each one is some geometric shape. Um, for example, uh, images of handwritten letters or you know, handwritten characters um, or images of uh, 3D scans of some internal organs in a patient. And using, uh, using that three-dimensional or that, that geometric information, you produce a barcode associated to each sample. And then you've transformed your, your set of samples in some space of geometric objects into a point cloud in the space of barcodes or persistence diagrams. And then it's useful to be able to do statistical analysis and compare are these two samples close to each other by saying, well, are there barcodes close to each other? And that's where um, bottleneck distance tends to get used. The, but we're, we're going to use it in a different way here. The other methodology is, in some sense, the one that came first uh, in persistent homology and topological data analysis. And this is to simply take a data set that's represented as a point cloud and then apply persistent homology in the form that I first showed to it to produce a barcode that then helps you try to understand the topological structure of this one single data set. So we get just one barcode, and by looking at that barcode, we want to understand our data. But the bottleneck distance turns out to be useful for this too. And let me explain how we define the bottleneck distance. So if we have a pair of barcodes, the, uh, the blue one here and the red one here, A and B, then a partial matching is going to be some way of matching up some of the bars of A with some of the bars of B. So I haven't necessarily matched all the bars. There, in this case, there's one blue bar that's unmatched and one red bar that's unmatched. So given a partial matching, we can define its cost to be the maximum of the difference in the uh, birth times for each of the matched pairs, the difference of the death times for each of the matched bars, or twice the length of each of the unmatched bars. And so you take the maximum of all these numbers and that defines the cost of a partial matching. And then the bottleneck distance is simply the minimum of the cost over all the possible partial matchings. And the fantastic theorem about the bottleneck distance um, goes back to 2005, Cohen, Steiner, Adelsbrunner, and Herrer. This is really the fundamental theorem that makes persistent homology useful in applications. Um, and in one form here, it says, if two point clouds are Hausdorff close to each other, then their barcodes will be bottleneck distance close to each other. So I've stated it a little bit informally. What they actually proved is a much more precise theorem, uh, but it, it implies this. So that, that's the famous stability theorem. Um, to illustrate this, uh, if you have some collection of points like this, there's a barcode, and if we jiggle all the points a little bit, then the small bars might vanish. Maybe some new small bars might appear. Th those are small changes with respect to the bottleneck distance, uh, because each small bar that's unmatched contributes only a factor of twice its length. So if its length is very small, it contributes a small amount. Uh, and then the big bars can shift by a little bit. Each of their ends can move to the left or the right by a small amount if we've jiggled our data points by a small amount. So that's a fantastically useful result. But unfortunately, it, it's not quite as robust as you might like because the barcode, even though it's sensitive to jiggling the data points, uh, sorry, even though it's um, insensitive to jiggling the data points, is highly sensitive to adding in outliers. So if I jiggle all my points, that won't move the barcode much. But if I drop in an outlier, some erroneously sampled extra data point, 
the barcode could change by a significant amount. In this case, dropping a point into the middle of this uh, cycle here kind of kills off that cycle at a much earlier time than it would have uh, been killed off if that point in the middle weren't there. So the barcode is very sensitive to outliers. Uh, and of course, in many, many applications, we have to deal with outliers. But there's an easy way to deal with this. You smooth your data set. So re we replace each point with a little Gaussian bump function around it. And this has the effect of smoothing things out. And now what we're doing is replacing our point cloud in Rn with a smooth function from R and R, a smooth real value function, in fact, a positive function. And then instead of doing this expanding balls, building the simplicial complex, the Viator's rips complex construction, we do a Morse filtration on the level sets of this function. So we define a sequence of spaces given by the, um, the downward level sets, the um, pre-image of the interval from negative infinity up to some level of T. And as you increase t, x sub t maps into x sub t prime. Each level set includes into the next level set. And the stability theorem in the form they actually proved is that if we have two functions which are close to each other in the L infinity norm, then the barcodes are bottleneck close to each other. I think they, they gave an explicit factor to 2 delta, or maybe it was delta or 4 delta, something like that. Um, so if you jiggle your function a little bit in the L infinity norm, then the barcode or the persistence diagram won't move very much. In this case, you can see the, the big bars, the points that are far from the diagonal, move a little bit. And the things which are near the diagonal, those red points near the diagonal correspond to the very small bars, they can potentially disappear. So this is the, the uh, fully precise version of the stability theorem that uh, Thomas Steiner, Adelsberger, and Herr first proved. But there's a little issue here that I kind of brushed over, and that's the fact that as you smooth out your data by choosing this uh, width for your Gaussians, you've had to make a choice. And that choice um, actually might depend on your data set. What you can see with a particular choice might vary depending on that particular choice. So here, here's an example uh, where we have two different features of very different scales and very different densities, plus some outlier points thrown in there. So the, the A feature is very large, the B feature is very small, the A feature is not so dense, and the B feature is a much higher density. And if we choose a small uh, width for our Gaussians, then we, um, we end up with this upper picture here where we haven't smoothed out the outliers enough. We haven't damped the outliers. And basically, we haven't solved the problem of being sensitive to the outliers. On the other hand, if we smooth too much, then this feature B gets more or less smoothed out of existence. You can see that there's a connected component there maybe but you can't see the uh, one-dimensional cycle in it. So we have to make a choice. And of course, the, the yoga of topological data analysis, um, going back to the very beginning of the subject, is whenever you make a choice, you shouldn't actually make a choice. You should simply look at how the topology of your object evolves over the range of all possible choices, or at least all possible reasonable choices, or at least some selection of uh, choices that's broad enough to capture some of the interesting behavior. And so this leads us directly to the idea of multi-parameter persistence. This is why so many people are really so heavily interested in uh, the challenge of multi-parameter or multi-dimensional persistence. This gives a possible solution. So one parameter persistence module is a functor which goes from the post set of real numbers to the category of vector spaces. So we get, if you take a sequence, an increasing sequence of real numbers, you get a sequence of vector spaces linked together by linear maps. In the, for example, two parameter case, we take the post set of real numbers and cross it with itself. And then we get a functor from this post set, or from this category, 
into the category of vector spaces. So you get a, a two-dimensional diagram like we have down here. And you can move to the right and you can move up and you can do um, kind of a, a taxi cab a metric uh, path to the right and to the up and then uh, up and then to the right and then up again. And you can move along, but you can never go down and you can never go to the left. And of course, we could also talk about a three parameter, four parameter, and parameter version of this. So multi-parameter persistence was first introduced in a paper by Carlson and uh, Zamorodian in 2009, um, where they called attention to, or they, they studied the moduli space of these uh, multi-parameter persistence diagrams. And they called attention to the fact that unlike the one parameter case, we can no longer uh, have a guaranteed choice of compatible bases for all the vector spaces in the diagram. You can start to choose your bases, uh, and then you'll find that at some point you just can't make it compatible with all the things that are going on. So that's a bit of a, a bummer. You, you can't get a combinatorial uh, description of your persistence module up to isomorphism. Um, and what this means is then also, we don't necessarily have well-defined birth and death times for cycles that we might see. We can't even identify a basis of cycles in a canonical way. And you can have situations where if you look out at some point in your two-dimensional diagram, you see a cycle and you can try to trace it back and it might trace back to the left somewhere and it might trace down to somewhere and you get two cycles which are then not related to each other at all. And so making sense of birth and death times becomes essentially impossible. Uh, cycles can be born independently in different places in your diagram. Jeff, can you explain that last example again? So um, you, had, you had some um, non-zero, non-trivial uh, element in the top right, and then you had elements. Uh, yeah, I mean, that... imagine a basis vector that starts at um, so if we have nothing in zero, zero, yep. and then we have a basis vector that appears in one, zero, and another yep. basis vector that appears in zero, one, right. they both get mapped to the same thing in one, one. Mm -hmm. right. But so you can't has, relate them to each other. Yeah, so, so I if, I, if I find that cycle, that, that vector in one, one, it can't decide that it was born in a particular place because it was actually born in two independent places. I see. Thanks. So that, that's the challenge. Right, um, right. People have, there, there's a lot you can say about the structure of these things and people have uh, done quite a lot. There's a, a now a ever increasing literature on the structure of uh, multi-parameter persistence diagrams. Um, one, one thing you can do is try reducing down to the one parameter persistence case by, for example, restricting to any line in your plane or in, in your n-parameter persistence space or uh, it doesn't even have to be a line, it can be uh, just simply a, a non-decreasing path uh, as long as it goes out to infinity. So uh, there's a software package called Rivet by uh, Lesnick and Wright, uh, which is uh, available uh, for free. You can go download it online. It's, it's fun to play with if you, it just does the two parameter persistence case, but it really lets you explore if you, if you start with a two parameter persistence problem, it lets you explore the one parameter persistence diagrams that you get from this. Um, using some techniques from uh, commutative algebra, um, there's a paper uh, by uh, Heather Harrington, Nina Otter, and Hal Schenk, and uh, Ulrika Tillman that uh, studies the structure of multi-parameter persistence diagrams with an eye towards characterizing and descri uh, describing the cycles that end up living forever in at least some direction. So there, there's a lot of structure there that comes from the underlying commutative algebra. Uh, and if you're interested in algorithms for computing these things, uh, Carlson and his collaborators uh, wrote a follow-up paper to the first one in which they gave algorithms um, that let you compute these things. And there are many, many more papers on this now. Uh, here's an example from uh, one of Carlson's papers. Um, so filtering by the width of your Gaussians uh, and the standard persistence parameter, or the Morse persistence parameter, isn't necessarily the only thing you might want to do. There are many other examples where you end up with two parameters that you want to vary. In this case, we have some collection of points that are vaguely organized 
into some curve. Uh, and Carlson says, well, you might want to filter or you might want to study persistence with respect to the radius of the balls around each of your data points, but also the curvature of the path that they're arranged along. And so this very naturally also gives you a two parameter persistence diagram. If you look along any fixed vertical line, then we have a standard uh, persistence problem. And if we look along a horizontal line, then uh, what we're doing is adding in as we move to the right, the bits of this curve where the curvature gets higher and higher. So it's a, a variation on a Morse filtration. Now, let's look at, at this interesting example. Um, I, I should uh, cite my sources here. So the, these figures come from a paper which I, I'm going to talk uh, very heavily about uh, later on, uh, the paper on uh, persistence terraces. Um, here's a, an interesting example where we have two features with the outliers, the, uh, the big feature with low density and the small feature with high density. Now, what I have down below here is a diagram from their paper where they look at the, the Morse parameter on the vertical axis and the width of the Gaussians on the horizontal axis. And what we see in this diagram is uh, the, the color is telling us the value of the first Betty number. At, so so the, there's, no, there's no persistence, no barcodes going on here. We're just looking at a plot of the first Betty number as a function of these two parameters. We haven't thought about how these Betty numbers, how, how, the, um, how the basis vectors might be linked together. Just plotting the Betty number here, you see two regions. There's a region B, which you can figure out corresponds to the small high density feature. And if you increase the width of the Gaussians, that feature very quickly becomes invisible. And at, um, um, at intermediate values of the width parameter, the sigma, we see for small values of the Morse parameter, um, we see a, a very large feature corresponding to this large cycle. So we, we see the two features in this one diagram here, but what we don't really see is any one line, even a path, that you could restrict this two parameter persistence diagram to in order to see both of these features at the same time. So in this particular example, there just isn't any way that you can reduce this to a one parameter persistence diagram that will see both of these by, by restricting to a line. Uh, so that, that's maybe a little bit frustrating. You know, you, you could play with rivet and as you slide your line around, you will only ever see evidence of one feature. And what you have to do is slide your line around and see evidence of a feature, move your line so that it disappears and then move your line some more so that a feature appears. And by doing that, you might figure out, you might uh, infer that there are two different features, but you wouldn't have evidence of the two features in the same, in a very strong way. And Jeff, so I have, I have two questions. So uh, first question, just uh, uh, clarification. So the reason why this A feature doesn't go very high up in the T parameter is just the density of those points around the circle A is smaller. Yeah. So that the height of this volcano is not very tall. Is that right? Exactly. Well, the, yeah. So the so the problem is um, where if we move to an intermediate value of the sigma, you know, the sigma around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, then what's happening is those outlier points in the middle of the A volcano are filling in the crater too much. And then another question. So um, <clears throat> there's two ways I could make my Gaussians wider. So uh, oh, you can't see my hands, can you? Uh, not at the moment. That's fine. That's fine. So one way to make the Gaussian wider is keep the maximum height of the Gaussian the same and then make the Gaussian wider, in which case you're always increasing this function f, yeah. um, the sum of the Gaussians. I think, or as you make the Gaussian wider, it gets spikier and so it gets taller. Yeah. I think uh, that, that would correspond to simply skewing this diagram. Okay. I guess the reason why I ask is that um, if, you're, if you're making the Gaussian wider, is that what you're doing? You're keeping the max height fixed and making it wider? Um, uh, well, th these diagrams are, are cribbed from this paper by uh, right. Chilton and Noah. Um, yeah, and the reason so, why I ask is because if, you, if you're making the Gaussians wider, then I see how this is really a multi-dimensional. It sort of could be increasing in both directions. If you're making yeah. the Gaussian um, taller and skinnier, um, yeah, maybe- Yeah, that, that, that's just a transformation. 
Yeah, yeah, but 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 how do you get those? How do you get the inclusions in one direction to another? Yeah, we're we're making them wider. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, Chill Moon and Noah John Circus are are making them wider. That, that's what they do in this paper that I'll I'll mention in a second. So here here here's the the reference to the paper. Chill Moon, Noah John Circusa, and uh, Nicole Lazar. Uh, persistence terraces for topological inference of point cloud data. Um, and so the idea they had, this is, I think, a, a really cool idea, is plot the Betty number as a function of your multiple parameters. And they do the, this relatively naive thing of simply forgetting about the persistence aspect. Uh, and yet they get a significant, impressive mileage out of it. So here, here's the diagram I showed before. Um, in a synthetic data example that's a little bit cleaner, you get actually something really beautiful. Um, here's an example where you have three features of slightly different sizes and slightly different densities. And you get this really beautiful, elegant diagram over here that clearly shows three different regions corresponding to each of the three features. And they each have a very distinctive shape. And you can see in the lower left corner, there's this darker green where the three regions appear to be stacked up. So you have a Betty number of three there, you have the intermediate uh, yellowish green where the Betty number is two, and then you have the yellow where the Betty number is one, uh, where you're only seeing one of the three regions at a time. So th this is a really striking figure that tells us maybe there, there's something more we could do here. So let, let's think about putting the persistence aspect back in. The, when you look at this along a single vertical slice for a fixed value of the, the smoothing, the, the Gaussian width parameter, um, it looks like you, you, you really expect that what you're seeing along the slice is the, the Betty numbers that correspond to a persistence diagram along this slice, or a barcode along this slice, where we have three bars stacked up. There's a, a short bar, a medium bar, and a long bar. A short bar, medium bar, long bar. We have three bars stacked up, and that we expect is what's giving rise to this diagram. And so now you would think about sliding your vertical slice horizontally. And those bars, it looks like, should sweep out three regions, an A region, a B region, and a C region. And so the two-parameter version of the barcode in this case should really be a parametrized barcode, a one-parameter family of barcodes where each bar sweeps out a region, and so a, a one-parameter parametrized barcode in this case is going to look like a stack of vaguely uh, polygonal regions. And so instead of a stack of bars, we have a stack of two-dimensional polygons now. This is what we would like to get, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, actually extracting, at least in a theoretical sense at the moment. We, we know how to do this now, and that, that's the point of this talk. So for a fixed value of the, the smoothing parameter, the, the Gaussian width, we can look at the one parameter persistence uh, diagram uh, along the vertical line there, moving upwards. And then if you move to the right by an amount delta, we get another persistence, uh, one parameter persistence problem moving upwards. And we can relate those two. The stability theorem that I quoted earlier says that there exists a partial matching of small cost. So the stability theorem guarantees for us that if we slide our vertical slice a little bit to the right, the barcode won't change much in the bottleneck distance. The long bars might have ends that move around a little bit, and some short bars might come into existence, some other short bars might disappear, but the barcode uh, won't undergo a drastic change. And so that seems like it's probably going to get us these uh, polygonal regions that we want. As we sweep across, we can trace out the bars. But there's a, there's a little bit of a problem. Is this small cost partial matching between the bars actually unique? And how can we find it? So that, let me illustrate where the non-uniqueness problem comes from. Uh, I've switched to the uh, persistence uh, diagram uh, picture here. So I've got two bars, two points in my persistence diagram. And as I 
tune that smoothing parameter sigma, they move a little bit. I get two more points which are close in the bottleneck distance, and I continue to move. Now, as long as the points are far apart uh, from each other uh, relative to the size of the, uh, the, the change in sigma, um, I can see there's going to be a, a unique uh, partial matching that realizes uh, the low cost. But as they get closer together, we run into some ambiguity. And if the two points collide, when they come out the other side, I can no longer tell which one is which. My partial matching uh, acquires a bit of ambiguity when there's a collision. And so that, that's what we want to resolve. We, we want to resolve these collisions. When two points in the persistence diagram come together and then move past each other, which one is which after the, uh, uh, after the collision? So that, that's the problem I'm going to talk about solving here. Now, sliding our diagram to the right, increasing the, the second parameter, induces a morphism of one parameter persistence spaces, um, or persistence uh, topological complexes, a, a natural transformation of functors from the post set of real numbers to spaces or to simplicial complexes. So we get this natural transformation um, that looks like this. X is the name of our, uh, our two parameter uh, persistence space here, our two parameter functor. Uh, and then we can take homology and we get a, uh, a morphism of persistence vector spaces, persistence modules. So let's examine uh, what morphisms of one parameter persistence modules do. So here I have abstractly two one parameter persistence modules and a natural transformation from one to the other. Now such a natural transformation relates their barcodes. We might naively hope that this is going to give us exactly that partial matching that we were looking for. Not, not just the existence of a partial matching, but this, uh, this natural transformation might somehow construct it for us. Well, let's see what happens here. This natural transformation will relate the two barcodes, uh, but it turns out that if, if you think about uh, where the generators have to go, the generator for a bar in M, the E1 here, has to go to a linear combination of the, uh, the shifts of the generators of bars that start earlier and die. Oh, my light is off. That's an energy saving feature of our building here. Uh, so, so the generator E1 uh, has to be sent to um, shifts of generators that start to the left, that start earlier, they're born earlier, and die earlier than E1. Right? E1 cannot be sent to E3 just for uh, reasons of algebraic constraints. Because E1 dies at a particular time, it can't be something, it can't be sent to something that, that dies later. It can only be sent to something that dies earlier. Um, so E1 is sent to a linear combination of E2 and E4 here, but it can't have any component in E3. Um, and in particular also, E1 is sent to a linear combination of things. Uh, it's mapped into some linear combination of bars. It's not just mapped to a single bar. So we're not actually getting yet the uh, partial matching that we hoped for. So there's a beautiful paper by uh, Ulrich Bauer and Michael Lisnick where um, it's called the Induced Matchings of Barcodes and the Algebraic Stability Theorem, uh, Algebraic Stability of Persistence. And so they, they were looking at this stability theorem and the, uh, there, there's something called the Algebraic Stability Theorem, which I'll describe now, which uh, underpins it. And you can actually deduce the stability theorem from the algebraic stability theorem. And they were looking at what underlies the algebraic stability theorem. And so they started studying the structure of morphisms of persistence modules and uh, how the barcodes are related. And what they showed is that if you have a monomorphism of persistence modules going from M to N, then this induces an inclusion of barcodes the barcode of M includes into the barcode of N. That, that means there's, a, um, there's an injective map from the bars of M to the bars of N. Uh, but, so, so it 
it identifies, it sends each bar of n to a bar of n, uh, but it can move the birth times to the left. So bars can get longer on the left side, but the death times stay unchanged. So every bar of m corresponds to a bar of n that has exactly the same death time. It's just that the bar in n can be born earlier, can extend to the left a little bit. Uh, so that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, and then there's a dual result about epimorphisms. If we have an epimorphism of persistence modules, then this also induces an inclusion of barcodes from M, uh, from the barcode of M into the barcode of the thing that uh, is, is uh, surjecting onto M. So that this is now a, a, a contravariant uh, construction. Uh, this time, it fixes the births and it moves the deaths to the right. And so as soon as you prove one of these, you can prove the other by uh, essentially uh, linear, uh, linearly dualizing everything. That, that's an interesting observation. And what they do with this is the following. If you have a general morphism of persistence modules, F going from M to N, it's neither an epimorphism nor a monomorphism, but we can factor it as an epimorphism onto the image of F, followed by the monomorphism into N. So we factor as an epi followed by a mono. And what this gives us then is a, a, a zigzag of uh, inclusions of barcodes using uh, the two things I stated on the previous slide. The, uh, the bars of the image of F get identified with a subset of the bars of M and a subset of the bars of N. And this gives us a partial matching from the bars of M to the bars of N. Okay, great. You, think, you might think this is exactly what we want now, but it's not quite. Uh, because it turns out if you pay attention to the contravariantness and which endpoints were moving to the left or the right, um, this partial matching only moves bars to the left. The birth time moves to the left and the death time moves to the left. So it's not quite what we're after. Uh, but Bauer and Lesnick uh, continue with this. So there's this notion of a delta interleaving. Now a delta interleaving says we have our two persistence modules, our two functors, and we have a natural transformation of functors from M to a shift by delta of N and from N to a shift by delta of M. So we have natural transformations uh, going in opposite directions uh, with this shift thrown in there uh, and subject to the condition that when we line things up here, the, um, there's a triangle that goes from MT diagonally downwards and then diagonally uh, upwards to MT plus two delta. So that triangle has to commute. And similarly, the triangle that starts at NT goes diagonally upwards and then diagonally downwards to NT plus two delta. That triangle also has to commute. So the, the upper triangle and the lower triangle both have to commute. Um, this is a delta interleaving between these two persistence modules. All right. So there's one more ingredient we need here, and that's the shift morphism. So if I have a single persistence module M, um, then the natural transition maps in this persistence module give me a morphism of persistence modules that goes from M to M shifted. And if you if you unwind this, what you see is this gives a uh, this gives us a canonical bijection between the bars of M and the bars of the shifted M, but it moves all the bars to the right by exactly delta. Okay, now we're ready to put things together here. So there's this, uh, in the, in the uh, milieu of the, uh, the stability theorem, the algebraic stability theorem, there's something called the isometry theorem, which is sort of the algebraic stability theorem plus the converse. And it says that if I have two persistence modules, M and N, then I can construct their barcodes. 
and I can look at the bottleneck distance between their barcodes. And the bottleneck distance between the barcodes of M and N is exactly equal to the smallest delta for which there exists a delta interleaving between M and N. Uh, so that, that's what's called the isometry theorem. It's, it's basically you can define the bottleneck distance either on the level of barcodes by looking at partial matchings, or you can define it on the level, uh, on the algebraic level of persistence modules by looking for the smallest delta so that you can construct a delta interleaving between the two modules. And then Bauer and Lesnick in the same paper proved they, they, they used this and, and the machinery that they developed to prove the following theorem. If you have a delta interleaving between M and N, you don't just get the existence of a partial matching that realizes that cost. You actually, uh, you can actually construct a canonical partial matching associated to this delta interleaving that has cost two delta. So I, I might have missed some factors of two in here, but um, if you're willing to overlook that, I've got this correct. Right. Uh, so a delta interleaving it doesn't just tell you there exists a, a, a low cost partial matching, it actually constructs it for you. And so the last ingredient here is geometric interleaving. If we, so th this is delta interleaving at the geometric level. If we start with a two parameter persistence space X, so something like uh, the uh, level sets or the, the downward level sets of our, uh, our of our Morse function or um, some other example where you you have a, a topological construction first that you then apply homology to and let's suppose that for any epsilon there exists a delta so that we have a geometric level interleaving so we have a delta interleaving between x at sigma and x at sigma plus epsilon. Right, so the, these are two different vertical slices of our two parameter persistence space now. We have the vertical slice at sigma and the vertical slice at sigma plus epsilon. And I'm asking for there to be, uh, a, so we have two vertical slices epsilon apart and I'm asking for there to be a delta interleaving between these. Then I can apply homology and I get a delta interleaving between the uh, corresponding uh, persistence vector spaces, persistence modules. Uh, and that constructs for me, using this machinery of Bauer and Lesnick then, um, a partial matching between the barcodes uh, at sigma and sigma plus epsilon that has this low cost. And so here, here's the picture that goes with this. I get an induced matching. And when you unwind this, remember, just using the morphism from one to the next, our bars could only move to the left. But the shift functor also allowed the bars to move to the right. And putting that together, we actually get the, uh, we get a partial matching that does exactly what we want. And we can then sweep our bars, uh, we, we can sweep sigma from left to right and watch how the bars, we can trace the bars as they move using these partial matchings uh, and sweep out these regions. So one, we choose one bar and it sweeps out this region here. Choose the next bar, it sweeps out this region here. We choose the next bar and it sweeps out this region here. And so we really can trace the bars as we tune our second parameter. And so this is really a parametrized barcode that we've got here. Uh, and this is the refined version of the persistence terraces that were in the paper of uh, Chal Moon et al. So we, we get the, this refined version of persistence terraces. Um, and the conclusion now is, well, we can refine persistence terraces into these stacks of polygons. So this is an interesting geometric uh, invariant that we can start to work with whenever you have a two-dimensional persistence problem, um, assuming that it fits into this situation of getting the geometric uh, delta interleaving. Then um, you can try to work with these uh, refined uh, persistence terraces and see if it encodes some interesting information. 
Um, from the examples that Chal, uh, Chalmun et al. Uh, played with, uh, we get the sense that large polygons will correspond to significant features. And the smaller polygons will tend to correspond to essentially noise. So we're in the uh, we're still in the uh, the uh, paradigm of using persistent homology on a single point cloud to get a topological descriptor of the shape of that point cloud. Hopefully, this is useful in some applications. Um, you can we we can imagine that this is going to be useful in uh, various situations, uh, but we haven't yet found the application that proves the utility of this. But it seems like an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, tool to have in your toolbox. Uh, and of course, the final problem uh, is to, to make this actually useful for anything, you'd better be able to compute it in an efficient way. Uh, so there's the challenge of setting up an algorithm to com uh, efficiently compute this. Uh, and that's something that uh, that uh, I hope to get on to soon. I, I should have said uh, this is a joint work with uh, with Noah John Sirkusa and uh, Chell Moon. So uh, setting up an efficient uh, uh, algorithm for computing these stacks of polygons um, is something that's uh, up there on our list of tasks to do. Uh, and uh, that's the end of my talk there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, if anyone has questions, now is the time to ask. And uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Unmute also the video, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm new to this. Hi. Can I just ask now? <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, it looked like you got some kind of decomposition almost in the last diagram. Uh, decomposition in what sense? Well, you got a two-dimensional two or two-parameter persistent module, and then you end up with these three shapes. Yeah. Um, so I'm like in one D, you get these interval modules, but these are not interval modules, right? The three shapes you get. This is something different. Well, so so each vertical slice of that diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, slices each of the shapes into an interval, and those are the bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, but then you connect the, them together horizontally, right? Yeah, uh, this induced exactly. matching so, thing. So each bar, as it evolves, sweeps out a shape. Yeah, but you don't use the horizontal maps. You just I, look at the bars. The horizontal maps separate. get used in constructing the um, the partial matchings from one vertical slice to the next. So I'm in a situation here where I'm not necessarily interested in the persistence in the horizontal direction. I'm really interested in the persistence in the vertical direction. Right. But to get to define persistence in the vertical direction, I had to choose a parameter. And I didn't know a priori which value to choose. So I do the topological thing of sweeping across all the parameter values. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm... I'm not sure I understand exactly how that process works, but I guess I have to read a little more in the paper to... Yeah, I mean, I think the, the point I wanted to make is that there there are many situations out there where you might genuinely be interested in two-parameter or three-parameter uh, persistence, right. but there are equally quite a few situations where you're not actually interested in two-parameter persistence, even though it looks like what nature gives you is a two-parameter persistence diagram. Mm -hmm. What you're really interested in is this one parameter family of one parameter persistence problems. Right. But what you're beginning with is actually a two parameter persistence module, right? Yeah, it's a two parameter persistence module. I'm just extracting some invariance from it. Right. Uh, in a different way. Yeah, all right, thanks. Jeff, in, in your uh, situation where you had <clears throat> different uh, um, widths of the Gaussians and then different scales, could you have instead swept from, say, top to bottom instead of left to right, or do you not have the necessary tools to do that? Um, if you sweep from top to bottom, um, I, I'd have to think about it, but I, I'm not sure you get the uh, the connecting maps going in that direction. It, it's uh, it's hard to get the uh, induced you can go, you can go bottom to top and left to right, but you can't go the other Sorry, but yeah, I meant, I meant bottom to top. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you sweep bottom to top? Yeah. Uh, 
we could do that. Uh, I haven't oh, done the experiments to see what it looks like. And then my next question would be the regions that you get when you sweep from left to right, are they the same as the regions you get when you sweep from bottom to top? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a good question. I When when I saw the Persistence Terraces paper uh, that uh, Noah and Chol wrote, I asked them that. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I, I see Chol is here. Um, yeah, uh, I asked them that and they said, oh, we haven't tried that yet. Uh -huh. And then these, these regions don't need to be convex just because you can no. have an interval get shorter and then longer again. Yeah. yeah. But the regions are simply connected because they're just intervals glued together. Yes. Okay. Contractible, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in, in the bottleneck metric, I don't think it, you're not allowed to have a bar split in half, which is uh -huh. the sort of move that you would need to, uh, to get a, a non simply connected region. You know, have a bar split in half and then join together again. Uh huh. When you when you uh, when you think about that, whether you get the same regions left to right or bottom to top, let, let me know what you learn. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm curious to see that. I, I need yeah. to. One one of us needs to sit down and actually write some computer code. Very nice. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so in that case, I would ask everyone to unmute themselves so that we can uh, so we can clap for uh, uh, Jeff and thank him for the talk again. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us, and um, we'll be seeing you again shortly. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>